Hello and welcome to the first chapter of my course in non-commutative algebra. In this video, we'll discuss some prerequisites, recommended reading, and the potential syllabus because topics as of this moment are subject to change, and then begin with an introduction to simple modules. For prerequisites, you'll be expected to know basic ring and module theory, including basic definitions such as different types of ideals, different types of rings, quotients and the isomorphism theorems for both rings and modules. For category theory, you'll be expected to know basic definitions of categories, functors, natural transformations, equivalence of categories, and the like. We will be mostly following the books Non-Commutative Algebra by Fab and Dennis, Introduction to Homological Algebra by Rotman, and the first course in non-commutative rings by Lamb. The following is an incomplete list of topics subject to change. I'm not going to read them out because there's a lot of them, but today we will begin with the first topic. So without further ado, let us dive into simple modules. Simple modules are, in a sense, the building blocks from which all other modules are constructed. They are also the simplest modules in terms of their structure. By convention, all of our modules will be left out modules, unless stated otherwise, but all the results proven on left out modules, unless specified, are also applicable to right out modules with an identical proof, just by replacing the word left with the word right. So an R module, which remember, we mean a left R module, is called a simple module if it has no non-trivial proper submodules i.e. if n is a submodule of m, then either n equals m or n equals the zero module. We begin with a fairly trivial example, but this example will be a leading example for us as to what properties we expect simple modules to follow. Vector spaces. So if R is a field, which we'll call F, then modules over R are just vector spaces, and every vector space of dimension more than one has a proper non-trivial subspace, i.e. proper non-trivial submodule. So the simple modules are exactly the one-dimensional vector spaces. Simple modules are in many ways generalizations of one-dimensional vector spaces, and we'll see that they have a lot of similar properties and play similar roles in both theories. Now, for a more substantial example, consider R to be uh, m sub n of f, the ring of n by n matrices over a field f. Fix some matrix uh, that we'll call A and denote the kth column of A by call sub k of A. Consider the set I of matrices whose only potentially non zero entries are in the first column, i.e., matrices of this form. Note that in particular, the first column doesn't have to be non zero. So, for example, the zero element is in I. I is a left ideal, in particular a left R module, because the definitions here coincide, and the action of R on I turns out to be the same as the action of R on Fn, which in both cases is matrix vector multiplication. Let M be any non-zero element of I, and let X be any other element of I, including zero. Then one can show that there is some element R in our ring, such that R takes M to X. I leave both of these statements as exercises with the following hint showing how to connect the two actions. We conclude that the submodule generated by M, which we denote by Rm, is equal to the entire module I for any non-zero element M in I. We call such a module cyclic and M a generator. As an exercise, you can show that I is a simple module, and in particular, it is a minimal left ideal because those definitions also coincide in the case of ideal. The previous example actually generalizes to arbitrary simple modules in the following way. If M is a simple module over the ring R, then for any non-zero element little m, the submodule generated by M is non-zero because it contains M, which itself is non-zero. So, by simplicity, the submodule generated by M is equal to the entire module, i.e. M is cyclic and every non-zero element is a generator, just like in our previous example. As a remark, suppose that R has a minimal left ideal I, then I is a simple R module. This method of constructing simple modules will be important later when we discuss the Van Art in theory, but note that this only works if R has a minimal left ideal, which is not true for a general ring. The natural question to ask then is, does every ring have a simple module? 
And the answer turns out to be yes, and it is actually quite simple to construct them. So we state the following proposition. For a non-zero ring R, there exists a simple left R module M. Of course, as stated in the beginning, all arguments here apply analogously if we replace every instance of left with right, and vice versa. Recall that for any non-zero ring, there is a maximal left ideal, which we will call I. The quotient R mod I then has an R module structure, a left R module structure, in the natural way. We claim that R mod I is actually a simple R module. For this, recall the correspondence theorem for modules which states that if m is a module and n is a submodule, then there is a bijective correspondence between submodules of m mod n and submodules of m containing n. Namely, if k is a submodule containing n, then k mod n is a submodule of m mod n. Since i is a maximal left ideal, the only left submodules of r, or equivalently left ideals, because that's the same definition in this case, that contain it R itself and the entire ring. So, by the correspondence theorem, R mod i has only two submodules, namely i mod i, which is the zero submodule in R mod i, and R mod i itself, i.e., the entire module. So, it is simple by definition. In fact, every simple module takes this form, as we shall see in a minute. So, to study left simple modules, we can study left maximal ideals and vice versa. So, we recall the facts above in the following proposition. Let M be an R module. The following are equivalent. M is simple, M is cyclic, and every non-zero element is a generator, and M is isomorphic to R mod I for a maximal left ideal I. It is important to note that in general, a cyclic module needn't be simple. In fact, a cyclic module is simple if and only if it is generated by every non-zero element. For example, R is a left module over itself is cyclic with generator 1, and simple if and only if it has no non-trivial left ideals. Note that in this case one can prove, even though it's not trivial, that R has no non-trivial two-sided or right-sided ideals either. In particular, this implies that R is a division ring. Uh, this is identical to the proof that a commutative ring with no non-trivial two-sided ideals is a field. If R is commutative, then R is simple if and only if R is a field. So the integers are a cyclic, non-simple Z module. We now prove the theorem. First, recall that we've shown one implies two in the previous slide, i.e. we've shown that a simple module is cyclic and all of its non-zero elements generate it. For two implies three, choose a non-zero element M in our module capital M. Then, by hypothesis, the submodule generated by M is equal to the entire module. To find a map phi from the base ring R to a module M, according to this rule, an element R is sent to itself times little m. Let I be the kernel of this map phi, and note that phi is subjective since little m is a generator. So R mod I is isomorphic to our module by the first isomorphism theorem. We claim that our module M is simple. Indeed, let n be a submodule, then either n equals zero, or there is a non-zero element x inside of n. But then, by assumption, the submodule generated by x is equal to the entire module. But this means that m is contained in n, hence n is equal to the entire module m. So m is simple. Since m is simple and isomorphic to r mod i, r mod i is also simple. So by the correspondence theorem again, the only left ideals containing i are i itself and the entire ring r, so i is a maximal left ideal. Finally, for 3 implies 1, recall that we proved in proposition 1.2 that for a maximal left ideal i, r mod i is a simple module. If r is commutative, it can be shown that the ideal i in the proof is independent of the element little m, so i is uniquely determined by the module, or rather by its isomorphism class. In this case, we get that isomorphism classes of simple modules correspond to maximal left ideals in R, where we can select the representative R mod I in every isomorphism class corresponding to the maximal left ideal I. For example, for the integers, the maximal ideals are those generated by primes, and the simple modules are those of the form Z mod PZ for a prime P. 
we see that all simple modules are cyclic and every non-zero element is a generator. This is again very similar to the behavior of a one-dimensional vector space where every non-zero element generates it. With the marked difference that simple modules are generally not going to be free unlike vector spaces. So try and think of when exactly a simple module is free. The next lemma may seem like a trivial observation, but it elucidates a very important fact of simple modules, which is that they have very few homomorphisms between them, and are therefore quite simple to understand and study. More precisely, Scher's lemma states that for a simple modules m and n, a homomorphism from m to n is either the zero homomorphism or an isomorphism. As for the proof, the trivial quote-unquote observation here is that the kernel of f is a submodule of m and the image of f is a submodule of n. But since m and n are simple, either the image of f is zero, i.e. f is the zero homomorphism, or it is equal to n, i.e. f is subjective. In this case, the kernel of f cannot be equal to the entire module m because that would imply that the image of f is zero but we just saw that f is subjective and n is non-zero, so the image of f cannot be zero. So we get that the kernel of f has to be zero. So f is also injective, so it is bijective and hence an isomorphism. In other words, either m and n are isomorphic or there are no maps between them besides the zero map. We finish with the following observation. M is simple if and only if the ring of R module endomorphisms of M is a division ring, where multiplication is composition. The proof is left as an exercise. For the right to left direction, I left a hint on screen. This concludes our introduction to simple modules. We will continue learning about them as we carry on, but for now we move on to the next step, semi-simple modules, next time. Thank you very much for watching and feel free to have any lingering questions in the comment section. I've left a link to my work in progress notes in the description. Have a great day.